I also think, you know, there's lots of people who say, well, ETFs are just index funds. You can't really express your economic view with ETFs. But as the ETF landscape has really matured over time, I think there's lots of ways that you can still express an economic point of view without having to go and pick individual stocks and be exposed to all of the company specific risk that's associated with that. It's, it's a really interesting thought exercise. The honest truth is, I don't really think anyone knows what happens if everyone indexes because it's never happened before. And I'm sure there's going to be lots of unexpected consequences if that we ever do get there. To the extent that I see stuff being labeled as artificial intelligence trading strategies, most of the time I kind of just assume that's just mostly marketing and they're not actually probably using too much artificial intelligence to trade stocks or, or kind of make money in the marketplace. Information provided by Wall Street Penning Zoo is for educational purposes only and not intended to be financial advice. Please consult with a licensed financial advisor before making any financial decisions. Hello and welcome back to the Wall Street Petting Zoo. This is our This Week at the Zoo segment. Ordinarily, we would review the week's market news and look ahead to the coming week, but this week we have something a little bit different for you. I'm your co-host, Christopher Smith. And I'm Robert Coburn. And today we are meeting with Nick McCollum. He is the Director of Growth for a startup called Passive. Nick, welcome to the podcast, and why don't you uh, go ahead and describe for our listeners what Passive is? Thanks for the warm welcome, Chris. I'm excited to be here. Passive is a modern portfolio management tool that allows you to turn your brokerage account into your own robo-advisor. So the way that Passive works is you create a Passive account, you pair your Passive account to your brokerage account, and then Passive does all of the work that allows you to set a target portfolio and rebalance to that target portfolio with one click. Once that's done, Passive monitors your account every day and sends you an email notification whenever you need to log in again to rebalance. So that's like the 30,000 foot high level overview of how passive works there's lots more sophistication and lots of configurable settings in there too but that's a broad summary can you give us a, a couple examples of the sorts of things that uh, you're able to set up with passive like what kinds of alerts and and uh, rules for managing my portfolio can i set up passive is highly configurable and i think the best way to understand the passive use case is to think about the problem that we're trying to solve so back you know in the early days of passive the original prototype was built by one of our co-founders, Brendan Wood, who was managing his own retirement account. He was managing his wife's retirement account, and he was managing a couple of child education plans for his kids as well. Now, each of those different accounts had different things that he wanted them to be invested in, and he was using a sophisticated spreadsheet to keep track of all of this. Now, spreadsheets are good for that type of calculation work, but it was still a high friction and, and high you know, investment activity because even though the spreadsheet told him what he needed to buy or sell to stay on track, he still had to log into his brokerage account and execute all of those trades manually. So still a lot of manual labor in there. The original prototype of Passive was just a script that read from his brokerage account and did the calculations automatically. Over the years, we've added lots more features like you mentioned. So now definitely our most important feature is our one-click trade functionality. So once you've set up your target asset allocation, Passive will rebalance you into that target asset allocation with one click. We also have notification emails that get sent to you whenever your portfolio drifts below a configurable setting that we call the drift threshold. So the way that that works is you set a target portfolio accuracy, which is defaulted to 90%. And whenever your portfolio accuracy falls below that, we'll send you an email that tells you you've drifted and that it's time to log in and rebalance using that one click trade functionality. Another setting we have or, or feature I would say is the ability to connect to multiple brokerage accounts. So if you had some investments at TD Ameritrade and you had some of your other investments at Interactive Brokers, Passive would allow you to pair to both of those institutions and provide a centralized dashboard for you to manage all of your investments in one place. We also have uh, advanced currency handling. We have cash notification emails so you can be notified whenever your periodic contributions hit your account and uh, some of our other kind of configurable smaller settings. But yeah, definitely lots of different ways that that investors use passive and lots of different settings that they can configure. So if, uh, if it's interesting to you, I could also kind of describe a couple of examples of how real people are using passive to manage their investments now. Sure. So it sounds like um, one major thing that you're trying to achieve here is like, let's say I want Tesla to be no more than 10% of my portfolio. 
and Tesla increases in price by a huge amount, and now it's 15% of my portfolio, then Passive is going to send me an email that says it's time to rebalance your portfolio. Is that one use case? Absolutely. And another common use case, I would say, is just telling you where to allocate your new cash. So most investors have some kind of like periodic contribution schedule set up. So they're they're putting money into their brokerage account once a month or, or once every paycheck or even once a week in some cases. So when that cash hits your account, in most cases, it doesn't automatically get invested. It just sits as cash in your brokerage account and earns you nothing. What Passive is really useful for is that when you cash hits your account, Passive will send you an email saying, hey, this much cash just hit your brokerage account. Do you want to log in and allocate it right away? So you can log in. Passive will do the rebalancing calculations and tell you which underweight asset to invest that new money in. Okay, that, those are good features. So it's going to help you um, eliminate some of just the, the potentially lost income from having cash sitting in your account that isn't invested. Um, does it have features for helping you maybe like time the market or automatically invest on something like a trend line cross or moving average cross? Are those the sorts of features that you guys offer? Or? As our name implies, Passive was kind of originally designed as a tool for passive investors. We have people who use it in all sorts of different ways now. Uh, definitely lots of active investors are using Passive to do things like direct indexing or managing portfolios of highly active fundamental individual stock picks. But in terms of calculating trend line crosses or anything like that, Passive doesn't actually help you choose which securities to invest in. Instead, you have to kind of self-educate or be um, financially woke enough, I guess, to say, you know, use a millennial term. You have to be financially woke enough to um, decide what you want to be invested in. And once you actually make that decision, Passive is kind of a great tool to help you make sure that you're on track along the way. Okay, that's really helpful. So let's talk a little bit about uh, passive investing in general. Passive, of course, um, famously was pushed by Jack Bogle, of the founder of Vanguard, um, who pointed out that uh, active fund managers were largely underperforming, you know, a total market strategy. So if you just had had your market or your money sort of evenly invested in the entire market and you didn't do any buying and selling, you would outperform some, you know, 95% of uh, active managers. And so for the last sort of three decades, passive has grown from 10% of total assets under management to over 45% of total assets under management are now in these passive funds that are sort of broadly invested in either total sectors or total uh, indexes in the market. Um, and combination of mutual funds and ETFs, mutual funds being funds that are sort of managed, you don't do, you, you can't really like instantly buy in or instantly sell. Um, it's more like you give your money to an asset manager and then that asset manager will sort of uh, put that money into um, assets whereas an ETF is traded on an exchange. And so the minute that I hit click that button, my money then is rebalanced into uh, the index. So a um, couple of different ways. ETFs, I think, are becoming more popular. They're sort of faster um, ways to get your money into the market. I, I'm curious what you think about ETFs versus mutual funds. What, what's your take on those two ways of doing passive investing? There's a number of different, you know, things that you can use to compare mutual funds and ETFs. The first one, I think you already kind of touched on, which is the trade frequency and like the trade schedule. So with mutual funds, you decide upfront how much money you want to put in the fund. But since mutual funds only trade once per day, you don't actually know how many units of that fund you're going to get until the trade settlement comes. So that's kind of one, you know, delayed feedback loop that is potentially a problem for mutual funds. On the other hand, exchange traded funds or ETFs, as their name implies, they trade on the stock exchange, just like Apple stock or Tesla stock would. So you can trade them in real time. You can get immediate trade confirmations. You can place limit orders so that you know you're guaranteed to get a price that you like. And, uh, you know, lots of more, I would say, modern trading avenues to trade ETFs versus how mutual funds are traded. The other thing that really stands out, I would say, is the fee structure. So mutual funds, I think just because they're an older vehicle and there might be more administrative costs in terms of running them, their fees are way higher. I think the typical mutual fund charges, you know, 80 basis points plus, maybe 1% in fees, which is a lot. Uh, and, you know, lots of ETFs are much, much lower than that. I know, I think the S&P 500 ETF is now uh, just a few basis points. And anyone who's from, <clears throat> for anyone who's unfamiliar with that term, a basis point is just 
a percent of a percent. So one basis point is 0.01%. And those fees don't actually sound like much, but when you compound them out over a really long period of time, a 1% management fee on your investments makes an insane difference when you compound it for decades and decades. So minimizing those fees is something that ETFs allow most DIY investors to do pretty easily. You can switch from a mutual fund to a comparable ETF and immediately get a lot of fee savings. We think that's some really low hanging fruit for individual investors to really pick up and improve the returns. And because of that, we're really big fans of ETFs. I also think, you know, there's lots of people who say, well, ETFs are just index funds. You can't really express your economic view with ETFs. But as the ETF landscape has really matured over time, I think there's lots of ways that you can still express an economic point of view without having to go and pick individual stocks and be exposed to all of the company specific risk that's associated with that. So for example, I work in software. I've, I'm a big fan of you know cloud computing. I think the move to the cloud is a strong trend that's pretty much inevitable at this point. So I think you know cloud, the cloud computing industry has a lot of organic and kind of macroeconomic tailwinds behind it. So with that said, I'm not, you know, I, I'm a big believer in the cloud computing industry, and I, that's kind of an economic view that I have. I don't have to go buy, you know, Amazon or Microsoft or Google, which those are the three biggest cloud computing providers. I don't have to buy those individual stocks to express that economic view because I can just go purchase the Bessemer Cloud Computing Index ETF. And there you go. It owns a diversified basket of cloud computing companies. And I can get exposure to that without getting individual stocks and getting all of the company specific risk that's associated with that. So the, mat the maturation of the ETF industry has made ETFs a really viable view, even for investors who want to express an economic view without owning individual stocks. Do you see a lot yeah, of uh, people who by uh, trading ETFs over uh, individual stocks through passive? Yeah, I would say like a lot of our largest holdings on the passive platform are definitely ETFs. I think a lot of that is just because our name is, you know, the company's name is passive, the software tool's name is passive. So naturally we're kind of by definition going to attract more passive investors than active investors. But we also have lots of power users who are using passive to manage portfolios of individual stocks too. So. Just because I guess the software is more popular for passive investors doesn't mean that it's not super useful for active investors as well, especially if you want to implement things like maximum threshold constraints. As an example, you might not want to have more than 5% of your portfolio in any of the dual stocks. So passive is a great way to track that and make sure you're not exceeding any of your diversification tolerances over time. We, we've definitely seen big changes in the ETF space. Um, I think at one point there were more ETFs than uh, than stocks on the exchange. I I'm not sure if that's uh, still true, but um, we've seen you know high turnover as well. Lots of ETFs closing as well as opening. Um, certainly, lots of different ways to express a market view. Um, I am wondering if investors should worry about bid ask spreads on some of these ETFs because, of course, some of them are kind of obscure, especially the uh, the ones that are like sector funds. Um, maybe even like equal weight sector funds I've noticed seem to be fairly illiquid, uh, not frequently traded. And so I'm wondering if you end up paying like fairly large costs in order to buy or sell those um, as a result of them being so infre infrequently traded and potentially having large spreads between the bid price and the ask price. That's definitely a problem, but I wouldn't say it's a problem that's unique to ETFs. If you're going out to buy, you know, the SPY ETF, which I think to my knowledge is the largest ETF in the world in terms of assets under management, you'll never really struggle too much with bid ask spreads because that security is highly liquid. It's, it's well traded. There's lots of trade volume. So I, I imagine there's pretty much no bid ask spread on that at any given time. But if you go down to, you know, some super niche sector constrained ETF that's doing like a value momentum complicated, you know, big brain stuff. And it's really niche. You might have $5 million in assets under management. Nobody knows about it. Nobody's trading it. You'll get big bid ask spreads there as well. That's no different than stocks. If you were going to look at Apple or, or Microsoft or Amazon, all these big, really liquid, highly traded companies, there won't be much of a bid ask spread there. But if you want to go down to the micro cap space, I know there's massive bid ask spreads. So that's definitely something that investors should be aware of. It's not unique to ETFs. I would say for anyone who's really worried about that, the easiest way to to cover your bases and make sure that you're not going to pay an unreasonable bid ask spread is to place a limit order. The the downside to placing limit orders is that your order might not get filled, but it all will also protect you from paying erroneous bid ask spreads when you don't necessarily need to. Yeah, yeah, definitely a useful thing to be aware of. Um, 
I am wondering about passive as a strategy in a zero commission world. I know that, you know, you talked about compounding costs and the tyranny of compounding costs. That was a famous point and a famous argument that Bogle made for um, the outperformance of passive, because when you factor in, you know, brokerage management fees and uh, commissions on trades and stuff like that, the active managers were greatly underperforming passive strategies where you just buy and hold. But of course, uh, just in the last year, we saw, you know, the major bro brokerages get rid of commissions. Um, of course, the the fees on these ETFs have come down quite a bit. I'm wondering if uh, passive, do you think passive is still going to greatly outperform active strategies? Or are we maybe in a world where some of those arguments for passive have less force than they used to? In terms of having no brokerage commissions, I guess what I would say is there's no free lunch and that definitely applies to the investment world too. So if you are using a brokerage to manage your investments and the trade commissions are free, you're still generating revenue for that brokerage in some way or else they wouldn't field you as a customer. So they might be doing securities lending from the securities in your account. They might be selling information about your trade data. So you might not be paying the commissions explicitly, but it's not that you know, they're just providing a free charitable service to you. They're still making money somehow. And I don't know, I'm kind of old fashioned. I'd rather know how I'm paying than rather know not how I'm paying. So paying $5 for a broker's trade to me is not a big deal. And part of that is because that doesn't actually compound. So if you buy a stock for five bucks, that's a one-time fee. It's very explicit what it is versus if you buy a mutual fund for 1%, you pay that every year for the life of your investment in that mutual fund. And assuming that the mutual fund has positive returns, that 1% fee actually gets bigger and bigger every year. So you invest $100,000, it's $1,000. If that grows to $500,000 over 20 years, then your fee grows to $5,000 too. So the thing with brokerage commissions is that they don't compound over time. They're a one-time fee. They're pretty transparent and they don't grow with the size of your account. So um, I would say, you know, the, the United States seems to be kind of firmly in the zero commission world now, but I don't think going from $5 to $0 is like as important as it was to go from $300 in the 1960s down to $5 in the 2020s. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that there's a point at which passive is maybe too crowded a trade? I mean, we've now got 45% of total assets under management in passive. I think you get, you know, a fairly high level of correlation between uh, the prices of different kinds of assets, especially in specific sectors, because as you pointed out, there is now some ability to sort of target a sector or target a factor. Um, but, you know, most of that money is in the index funds um, and people are sort of piling into, especially the NASDAQ, because it has the highest returns and you get sometimes kind of a, a price cascade where the worst performing assets just keep getting cheaper and the best performing ones just keep getting more expensive until there's some kind of shock that that shakes things up and i think maybe that's part of what has happened with value versus growth over the last 10 years is people have sort of piled into the nasdaq because it has had uh higher returns than the dow um or you know the deep value kinds of funds um so i'm wondering is there a point at which you need to be a little bit contrarian about passive is it is there a risk now in piling into passive when it's such a crowded trade? You kind of bring up a great point in that, like what happens if everyone indexes, if we go 100% passive investing, who sets prices, right? So we would basically have the same S&P 500 forever and there'd be no one to move prices within the 500 stocks in that index. So it's, it's a really interesting thought exercise. The honest truth is I don't really think anyone knows what happens if everyone indexes because it's never happened before. And I'm sure there's gonna be lots of unexpected consequences if that we ever do get there. I don't think we'll ever get there though, because to the extent that someone wants to beat the market, like everyone wants to beat the market. It's just, I think a lot of people are wising up to the fact that it's extremely unlikely and hard to do, but there will always be a market for people who want to beat the market. And there will always be a market for people who want to professionally manage money. So it might get smaller and smaller over time, but I would be very surprised if we ever get to a point where we are hundred percent past investors. In terms of the price cascading mechanism that you talked about, I would say that you are right. So with more passive investors and less active investors, the active investors that do remain have more control over price movements. And those price movements are kind of exacerbated by the, I guess, the following of the passive investors. So if you think about a world where everyone's a passive investor except for me, and I want to bid up the price of a stock, that higher price will cause all of these index investors to follow me into that trade. And it will get bid up much more than I actually originally bid it up myself. So 
a lot of people have said that that's part of the reason why Tesla stock has exploded so much. It was included in the S&P 500 and suddenly, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of passive money had to be, you know, benchmarked to that for the first time. So definitely the rise of passive investing has had some interesting market consequences. I think measuring those is hard, but if you just kind of use some basic intuition, you can see directionally what it might cause kind of in the future. Yeah, and people are inherently greedy, inherently greedy so uh, there will always be people that want to beat the market and supersede as much as they can. Absolutely. I'd also add that people are, you know, some people anyway, are, to an extent, are inherently arrogant. So you can tell them all day long how hard it is to beat the market, but there will always be people that will try. I sort of, I feel like I'm a fairly active trader. Um, I go in with wise eyed, eyes wide open that I'm probably not going to beat the market, but I definitely have a little bit of that arrogance that I think it would be really cool to do so. <laughs> well, even me, like, so I'm, I work at Passive, which is a, you know, was originally thought of as a platform for passive investors. I am 95 or 90% passive investor, but I still like to own a couple individual stocks here and there because to be, to be completely honest with you, it's kind of fun. And I think the markets are awesome. It's a great hobby, but I'm also kind of wise to the fact that, you know, I'm not, I'm not as young as I used to be. I don't have the same risk tolerance and owning individual stocks for the majority of my net worth is probably not like the best recipe for success for the long run for me. I agree with you. I think that sense of fun is never going to entirely go away. Um, I do worry a little bit about the, uh, the sort of piling in though. I, I mean, I look at, you know, the valuations on a company like Apple, where it's trading more than 50% above its uh, sort of median price over the last four years and i just wonder how long that can really go on <laughs> but uh i let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the technology side because of course you guys have built this great tool uh that helps retail investors sort of compete with institutions but institutions of course have much more powerful tools um i see investors complain a lot about algorithms and sort of blaming algorithms for dramatic price movements. Um, I think the role of algorithms is probably exaggerated to some extent. And I noticed that a lot of the people who complain about them invoke them as a kind of boogeyman and don't make a lot of effort to understand how they really work. Um, and in fact, it seems to me that if algorithms are really such big market players, it's probably possible to take advantage of them. I find that rules-based systems like algorithms rarely last for very long before somebody figures out how to game them. Um, but I, I'm wondering how big a role do you think algorithm uh, trading really plays in the market? And is it something that retail traders need to be concerned about? I mean, is it a situation where basically, uh, you know, there's a, a limited amount of time that retail traders are even going to be able to compete when the institutions are armed with tools like this? Yeah, I mean, I think retail or yeah, algorithmic trading has kind of impacted the ability by which retail investors can react to news events to make money in the market. So, you know, if, if you look up a press release right now, I don't think I have ever seen a press release and then checked the stock and noticed that the stock hasn't moved yet. Now, why do you think that is? Is it because there's people who read much faster than I am, or is it because there's computers who kind of read it first and already have traded the stock before I get through the first sentence? I think it's probably the latter. So that's kind of one natural consequence, I would say. In, in other areas, you know, there's lots of trade algorithms at market makers and other kind of high frequency trading shops that people have a lot of strong opinions about. I would say that a lot of those places are making, you know, microsecond transactions to squeeze a one penny between two traders. And as much as that might seem weird, I think there's some evidence to suggest that it actually improves liquidity and price discovery in the marketplace. So. The actual impact of high frequency trading and algorithmic trading is really, really hard to discern. But I would say you kind of have to take a look at it with a balanced perspective and consider that, you know, with more trading being done in the marketplace, it probably does add a little bit of liquidity. So that's that's maybe not entirely a bad thing, I guess. There have been a few attempts, of course, to create AI managed ETFs. Um, so far, I think they've pretty dramatically underperformed the market, but it's an attractive idea because Whereas an algorithm is like a rules-based thing that could potentially be gamed, an AI ETF could potentially react in real time to people trying to game the system. Um, and an AI ETF would give the general public access to that as opposed to having it limited to institutions. I'm curious, how much use do you think institutions are already making of AI for um, gaining an edge in the stock market? And how long do you think it might be before we see a really successful AI managed ETF that's available to the general public? 
I'm not I, an artificial intelligence expert. I've dabbled a little bit in, in machine learning and neural networks and, and some of the deep learning techniques. But I will say that all of those techniques require absolutely massive data sets in order to make accurate predictions. And I don't think we have that those levels of data sets in the stock market. So we have price data on stocks accurately, maybe back to the 60s or 70s and, and fundamental data, maybe a little bit more than that. But you know, that's what 50 years of data times 250 trading days a year. So we're talking like maybe, you know, 12,000 data points for each stock. That's a lot, but you know, artificial intelligence needs millions of data points. So to the extent that I see stuff being labeled as artificial intelligence trading strategies, most of the time I kind of just assume that's just mostly marketing and they're not actually probably using too much artificial intelligence to trade stocks or, or kind of make money in the marketplace. Now, with that said, in, in the broader world of like business, I think artificial intelligence has really good applications. Google uses it for, uh, you know, photo recognition. I know a lot of payment processors use it for fraud detection and, and those sorts of things. But like I said, those are all things that have much larger data sets that they can use to train these models on. Google has, you know, Google images, which might just be the biggest repository of images in the world. Companies like Stripe have massive, massive databases of credit card transactions that they can use to train their fraud detection engines on. So you need really, really big data. And I'm not super convinced that we have those levels of data sets in the stock market to train these things on. But that's just kind of like my own personal opinion. And if you know someone listens to this and has a really cool AI model they want to tell me about, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, I would find it very, very hard to find a company that would be willing to sell that to the general general public rather than just uh, selling them a product with that behind it so in other words they wouldn't sell you the AI they'd sell you the they sell you the portfolio behind it and basically not tell you how it works Nick um, go ahead and give a plug for passive uh, tell our listeners where to find you guys uh, how to sign up and what what that would entail if they wanted to be uh, a part of that Absolutely. So just as a quick recap, we, we, you know, our goal for passive as a company, like our mission is to make DIY investing accessible for everyone. We're hoping to build a really, you know, a platform where you can kind of manage your investments anywhere with a lot of simplicity and a lot of ease of use. So if you guys want to try it out, our website is passive.com. We have a, a money back guarantee. So if you try the product, you don't like it, uh, you know, just email us and we'll refund you. No questions asked. The only questions we might ask you is what we could have done to make you uh, more satisfied, but yeah, we also have a free version that you can try it without paying anything. And that's all at passive.com. You can also find us at Twitter. Our handle is passive team. And if you'd like a demo of the product or, or you know, you have questions that you want answered, you can feel free to email me directly. My email is nick.mccullum at passive.com. Yeah, we'll put, I mean, we'll make sure to put that information in uh, below the video and also on the Podbean description as well. I really appreciate you coming on, Nick. I think these are huge um, issues, really important issues that traders need to be aware of. Um, you know, ETFs, the role of technology. We're in a rapidly changing world now. And, um, you know, these are things that people need to stay on top of. And I think you brought some great insights. So I really appreciate you bringing your insights to our podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you both. All right, folks, that's our podcast for the week. If you would uh, like to support the podcast, please give us a like, share, or comment on your favorite social media platform. Uh, you can also find us on uh, Podbean, iTunes, YouTube, uh, Spotify, and Stitcher. Um, leave us a five-star review. That would be really helpful. We don't do any advertising for the podcast, so anything that you can do to support us uh, would go a long way to help. And uh, underneath our YouTube video, we've got some referral links to uh, brokerages. If you use those referral links to set up a brokerage account, uh, you will get some free stocks. And we also will get some free stocks, and that helps support the podcast as well. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you back at the zoo next week. See you.